Hello, welcome today to today's webinar, From Ideas to Events, Engage and Connect at AES, hosted by the Events Coordination Committee. I'm Vincenzo Nelli, the AES Training and Development Manager. By the end of today's webinar, you will learn ways to get involved in AES at various levels and connect with the right people to turn your event into an idea. Before we dive into the heart of today's discussion, let's take a quick look at some of the exciting events that we have lined up for you in the coming months. So at the end of April, we have our International Conference on Audio for Games in Tokyo, Japan. You'll see uh, May 29th to 31st, we have the Audio and Music Induced Hearing Disorders in Copenhagen. We have the International Symposium on AI and the Musician, June 6th through the 8th in Boston. Our uh, European Convention is June 15th to 17th in Madrid. Uh, International Conference on Automotive Audio is in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, June 26th to the 28th. Audio Forensics, June 27th and 29th in Denver, Colorado. Um, International Conference on Audio for Virtual and Augmented Reality, August 19th through 21st in Redmond, Washington. And finally, uh, to round out the year, the AES show, New York, October 9th through 11th in New York. These are just a few of the examples of the fantastic events that you can expect from the Audio Engineering Society. We're committed to providing you with valuable insights, networking opportunities, and the chance to stay up to date on the latest trends in audio technology. For more information regarding AES events, please scan the QR code on the screen. Before we delve into today's discussion, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Today's session will be recorded and posted uh, on AES Live and our YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you have any questions for a panel, please enter it in the Q&A function um, of the menu bar, or you can actually use the chat. I don't think we have the Q&A today, um, but also we have a fairly small group, so you could also raise your hand and we could try to unmute you so you can ask your question uh, live. To get a feel for our audience, uh, we're going to launch a quick poll to determine who's in the room. So uh, let me find that poll and uh, let's get it launched. Give me one second. All right. So we have a couple of questions. What is your current membership type? How long have you been an AES member? Do you currently serve in a volunteer role within AES? Do you have an idea for an event? Share one word that you would use to describe how you feel after an AES event. Do you wanna get more involved within AES? So, Good, looks like we got some results coming in. Keep this up for a little bit longer. And keep those uh, responses coming in. If you do serve in a uh, volunteer role, why don't you, you can put it in the chat box too. Let us know what role you serve in. <clears throat> All right, it looks like we have about 88% participated. I'll let it go for 10 more seconds and then we'll end the poll. All right, I'm gonna close the poll in uh, two seconds. Three, two, one, and let's share the results. So uh, we have 75% of our attendees are members. Associate members are 19%. We have uh, one life member at 6%. 19% um, of our attendees have been a member less than a year. Uh, the largest number is more than 20 years. That's great. Uh, at 44%. Uh, 
A 60% do not serve in a volunteer role, while 40% do. Um, it looks like uh, about 30% have an idea for an AES event, while 71% do not currently have one. And let's look at the uh, one word. Let's see. Energized, excited, educated, informed, full, informative, invigorated, energized again, motivated, inspired, motivated again, excited, engaged, excited. So we've seen a lot of engaged, excited, motivated. That's great. And uh, do you want to get more involved within AES? 80, nearly 80% said yes, they do. So that's uh, that's awesome. All right, let's get back to uh, the script. i just share my screen real quick again. Today's presenters include Leslie Fogel. She's the chair of the uh, ECC Conference Committee, Brett Leonard, the chair of the ECC Convention Committee, and Brad Swanson, chair of the ECC Training and Development Committee. Leslie, Brett, Brad, thank you for volunteering your time to support AES and the Event Coordination Committee. Uh, please take a moment to introduce yourselves and tell us uh, you a little bit about your role within AES and how your volunteer experience has been so far. So, Leslie, I'll ask you to... Uh, there you go. Hi, hello everyone. Um, my role in AES, I'm a governor um, and chair of this conference committee. Um, I mean, do you want me to go into conferences right now, Vincenzo, or just introduce myself? Just introduce yourself. All right, that's it. I'm a governor and uh, chair of conferences. And as far as the role volunteering has played, um, you know, it's been great. It's it's great to work with everybody so involved and to come together on making things happen. Thank you, Leslie. Brad? Yeah, uh, so I got involved with volunteering with AES sort of for the first time, you know, with student section during graduate school and then my local section and then uh, starting to sort of peek in on different committee meetings to try and get involved. So contributing a little bit to the education committee and then eventually this events coordination committee uh, where I, I work on a small subset of events, which we call training and development. You might hear us use the acronym TND, which we refer to sort of offhandedly. Um, but we'll talk more about what those events involve. And Brett. I'm Brett Leonard, and I am the chair of the convention subcommittee of the ECC, and I had a very similar sort of volunteer experience uh, to Brad, it sounds like. I got more involved as a student um, when I was a graduate student, and from there became involved uh, primarily with papers at conventions for a couple of years, and, um, and I still take part in the publication policy committee and on the, the local section level, but uh, I'm working on the convention committee, which uh, serves to help uh, kind of moderate overall conventions, help form uh, convention committees and things like that. So if you'd like, I can launch right into that since that I think is the next step on our agenda. That's perfect. So Conventions are probably, uh, or sorry, let me start, take a step back and talk about the ECC. So um, the Event Coordination Committee, which we're all a part of, and we have some other uh, members, a couple of whom are here, I believe, um, serves to uh, try to coordinate and, and make a cohesive package out of all of the AES's events. Um, there are so many things going on within the society, and sometimes... Uh, in the past, there were even situations where two people had amazing things happening and, you know, a week out, somebody realized that there was a conference or a T&D event that overlapped with a convention or, or two things that were back to back halfway around the world. So people were sort of necessarily excluded from attending or participating in both. So the ECC focuses on the national and international level uh, events. So Conferences, training and development, and conventions serve the entire constituency of the AES. 
outside of the AES, though, there's still plenty going on with regional events, section events, student events that uh, have a smaller constituency. So they're organized at a more local level, whereas these larger international events all come through the ECC to make sure that there aren't these overlaps or, or conflicts or even duplicative events where two people might be organizing a very similar conference and uh, until they all come to one place, uh, we run the risk of, of perhaps diluting the audience or diluting the content for some of those events. So my particular role within the ECC is looking at conventions. Uh, conventions are probably one of the event types we're most familiar with. They tend to be the big flashy, uh, commercially sort of focused um, areas of the AES. Probably most uh, familiar are the AES convention and show type events, which uh, most recently have been in, held in New York. Uh, previously, there was uh, LA and, um, and uh, San Francisco shows as well. So these events are really broad. They could have a broadcast section, session and a recording session and new research on speaker designs all happening at the same time. And then down the hall, there are exhibitors um, and sponsors who might have demo rooms or new products or kind of anything and everything that falls into the AES category. So they're very um, topic agnostic. It's whatever's going on in the industry. You can see a little bit of everything uh, in one building. And that naturally sort of narrows down to Leslie's area, which is conferences. Okay. So conferences are, um, they're held internationally and they have a scientific and academic focus on a specific track or topic or field of engineering. And they bring together experts in that field. They require peer reviewed papers. Um, they bring together experts in that field to network and to advance audio and technology in that field. Uh, the papers are published in the AES e-library. Uh, what else? Conferences are run by volunteers uh, with, with HQ. Um, and that's the gist. We just approved the 90th conference for AES, which is pretty neat. Um, and that leads to what, Brad, t and yeah, so T and D, which again the acronym is Training and Development, um, uh, but you'll hear us use these two acronyms, ECC and Training and Development. It's Events Coordination Committee is ECC, Training and Development is T and D, um, and these T and D events sort of capture all the stuff that falls outside of conventions and conferences that are organized at the larger level. So in that graphic that Brett shared, where you saw the ECC was sort of covering these three blocks of events, but then section events and regional and student events, those still sit outside of these things. So um, training and development doesn't involve those. Those are still managed by those, those section leads and committees. Um, but these training and development events uh, were sort of formalized around the pandemic when we had to take a lot of programming online. And we also recognized the need to come up with um, event tracks and event types that addressed sort of member education needs outside of these traditional convention and conference realms. Um, so a, a very simple way to think about it is we're in most cases removing the scholarship component where there aren't peer-reviewed papers at any of these T&D events. Um, so that's kind of the, the simplest way. If you don't see uh, peer-reviewed papers that are going to make it into the e-library, that's probably a training and development event. And the, the goal here is to create new content and types of events that serve our members beyond those larger conventions and conferences so we can engage more members, uh, make sure members are renewing their, their thing, and they're really happy to be a part of the AES. Um, this allows us to also program some events in new subject areas where maybe um, there's a topic we want to talk about, but it's not a big enough topic to, uh, in terms of, of scholarship and, and academic research to justify having a conference on it. Or it could just be that 
there's a conference coming up, which is going to address the academic and scholarship side of it. But we also want to have some sort of warm up events to start getting people thinking about these subject areas and maybe um, encouraging them to go attend that conference and and dive in at a more rigorous level. Um, we, this is also a play to promote our visibility beyond AES. So we're mostly AES members here in this group right now. Um, but we're always trying to recruit more members and provide benefits to the broader audio community, even outside of our membership. So hopefully we'll see more members joining our ranks and also retain the members that we have. Um, and this also provides an opportunity where there are corporate uh, sponsors who want to be very supportive of the AES. They recognize the value that the AES provides for our community. They're willing to sponsor events and share training uh, training opportunities and, and things like that. Um, but that is slightly adjacent to the, the mission of like a scholarly conference or an academic research focus conference where we still might have sponsors, but we don't really want it to be led by a commercial entity. Um, so this gives us, these T&D mm -hmm. events give us a window to sort of capture these different types of events. And Vincenzo, if we could see that next slide, we can see some different examples of these types of events. So uh, maybe the simplest one to explain is a webinar or a series of webinars. Uh, this event we're having right now could be considered a training and development event. Um, but in terms of other uh, types of webinars, our standards committees have had a series of webinars in the past where they talk about the progress that's being made, the revisions they're making to different standards. Um, there was a great program uh, it was, I guess, two weeks ago um, that got together. Um, it was uh, three three of the people who worked on the Disney film Encanto, uh, Jermaine Franco, who could compose the score, Mike Elizondo, who was a producer, worked with Lin-Manuel Miranda to bring the songs to life, and David Boucher, uh, who's a great mix engineer, um, who was also charged with recording most of this stuff and they were doing it all during the pandemic. So that was uh, organized by Jeannie Montalva Lucar, who was actually one of the co-chairs of the AES convention and show here in New York last year. Um, this Encanto event came up as an idea for something they were going to have at that 2023 convention, but getting that those three panelists to New York on the same day at the same time is nearly impossible. Even when they were collaborating on the film, they were hardly ever in the same room together. So uh, this made sense to say, this is still a great piece of programming that we wanna to bring to our membership, but it's not realistic to get them to a convention at the same time. Let's just do something online after the convention where it's very easy for them. You know, It still took a lot of coordinating to find a time that works, but it was easier to find 90 minutes that worked for them and they could all be in remote locations. So those are examples of different types of webinars. Um, academies are, are a term we're using for sort of a more formalized series. Um, so I think the best e example of this is the Immersive Audio Academies, um, which have been led by our past president, Andreas Mayo. Um, he's had seven of these now. We're planning an eighth. Um, these have all been online events, but we're leaving space, hopefully, for possibly having some in-person immersive audio academies in the future. And this has covered a, a wide variety of topics. They've ranged from just an hour and a half to one was four hours long, going into really uh, great conversations about uh, the diverse field of immersive audio. Um, but we've also, we had an EDM academy. Uh, we've had a music production academy. So, um, Lots of events that are are sort of they're larger than just a single webinar. There are a, a number of different programming things that all come together around one subject. A symposium uh, we're sort of loosely defining as this is something that's probably going to be kind of like a conference, but without that peer reviewed paper component. So uh, uh, we had a modern music production symposium a couple of years ago, a machine learning symposium a few years ago. These were online because of the pandemic. Um, but we have an upcoming one, uh, which will be taking place in Boston uh, at the Berkeley School of Music on um, AI and ML applications in music technology. There will be a small paper component, um, uh, but not peer reviewed. Um, and then lots of workshops and presentations around that. So uh, we're very excited to get back to in-person symposia. Uh, and then 
that will be sort of a warm up for for all the other scholarship and academic research that's going on around AI and ML right now. And the last thing, which we haven't had in quite a while, is an industry summit, um, which is really a commercial influenced event, usually in conjunction with a sponsoring company. So a great example of this was uh, it was called the Live Console Academy, just to make this confusing. But uh, it was held at NAM, and uh, I believe it was Yamaha was one of the sponsors. They were doing training on their digital consoles uh, there at NAM. So a great opportunity for AES to collaborate with one of our sponsoring partners and say, how can we get a bunch of our members and a bunch of passionate audio professionals there to benefit from training on Yamaha consoles? So that's uh, sort of a nutshell description of all this stuff that training and development uh, captures. Great. Thanks, Brad. Um... Next, we we're going to discuss different ways to get involved with AES. So uh, that'll be a group discussion. Let me uh, share my screen again and pull up uh, another slide. So um, I don't know if you want to lead this, Brad. Yeah, sure. I, I can kick it off. Um, I think Vincenzo mentioned this at the beginning, but I think it's really important to emphasize uh just about everybody you see at an AES event, whether they're a panelist, a presenter, um, uh, part of the organizing committee, they are volunteers uh, and all their time is volunteered. It's not like uh, we pay people to be parts of workshops or webinars or anything like that. Um, so we are an entirely volunteer driven organization. We have Vincenzo, Vincenzo, Monica, and this great staff at HQ who are professionals in in doing this work but they are they are working um alongside what is mostly a a massive volunteer organization so there are all these volunteer opportunities that uh that span the gamut from you know local activities to working on these international events um and like Brett and I were mentioning at the beginning, and I know Leslie is also very involved in her local section. Uh, just getting involved in a local section is a great way to start contributing and start having an influence on the programming that uh, makes it up to the international level. And the other thing is, uh, since the pandemic, so many of these local events, if you look in the loop or our newsletter, uh, these local events are now open to everybody because they'll be held online. So I'm so grateful for all the great programming that comes from local sections, student sections who make it available to all of us online. Um, and that's that's a great first way to get involved. Um, another thing is the Technical and Standards Committee, which are, are really at the core of the AES's mission. Um, and these Technical and Standards Committees uh, they are also some of the driving forces in what becomes conferences or what becomes tracks at a convention. Leslie, could you think of an example of one of the technical committees that's driven one of our upcoming conferences? Oh, almost all of them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Especially the, the, the reoccurring conferences, um, you know, automotive forensics, sound reinforcement. Those are all, uh, committees. Um, so pretty much all of them, they meet regularly and decide when they have enough material and, um, to put on a conference. Yeah. So I, I think for somebody who's interested in one of those topics or has expertise in one of those areas, uh, I think that's, that's the most natural starting point is to get involved in one of those committees where all the other experts are living. And it's really easy to put a workshop together on one of those topics when you're already in committee meetings with those people. Yeah, it's, I think that's a an important point too. Like you said, putting together a presentation. So much of the content um, at conventions comes through technical committees. You know, people are are dealing with some technical hurdle or challenge to the industry. And after a meeting, they say, you know, we should do a workshop on this because I bet a lot of other people are having these same, these same problems or questions. Um, so it's a real great gateway to getting into the next bullet point, uh, which is actually proposing content for, for any of our various event types. Yeah. Brett, could you describe that process a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, especially for conventions, but but really for kind of all of these, and we'll talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of the proposal process, but 
all of the the events that AES runs are really driven by members. And I think I think I'm probably not alone in most of my research or my own sort of scholarship work comes out of I have a question and I decide to try to figure out the answer with with some of my friends, some of my colleagues, some of the people on this call. Um, So uh, you get a critical mass of people together in the case of, let's say, a workshop or a tutorial. You get a couple of experts together or people who are all working together uh, or separately on the same topic area or problem challenge uh, or segment of the industry. And you you sort of generate an hour's worth of content or a half an hour's worth of content with an expectation of a really robust discussion and package it together and say, hey, we'd like to put this group together and uh, take an hour in an upcoming convention or maybe a conference or a T&D event to really dig into this, this timely topic that faces our industry. Um, for conventions specifically, there's a call for participation. And similarly for conferences, you see calls for participation where uh, it says, hey, we'd like to get proposals for workshops or or tutorials. So that part of the process is sort of already built in, but we're, we're developing a wider reaching um, system for gathering some of those ideas that we'll, we'll hit upon a little later today. Yeah, that, it's such a great point. And this, this as an entry point was kind of obscured to me. I didn't realize it when I was an, an early member in AES. And I think what got me was I was complaining to somebody and saying, wow, the AES show, they should have more programming like this. And he was like, why don't you shut up and do it? I didn't realize <laughs> it was something that I could do. Yeah, there's, there's, I, I'm hoping, you know, if ev- if there's one takeaway from today uh, that everyone knows a little bit more how much they can be involved. You know, I think all of us probably were at a similar point at at one point in our, our time with AES where we said, oh, you know, it'd be great if we did a little of this. And, and somebody goes, you know, you can do that anytime you want. And, and that's the gateway to really diving in. Um, so all of these all of these things are really possibilities if you just reach out and hopefully we'll get the the list and the way to find the right people. That's really the biggest challenge a lot of I times. I think the point of this webinar is we're trying to make that easier. Yeah. We're trying to make the the jumping start point easier instead of like, I want to do a, propose a conference or I want to propose a workshop. Now you can start with an idea and the three of us can look at it with HQ and get it to the right place. Um, and that's good too for people that want to do new conferences and don't necessarily have the networking with other experts in their field. It can start with an idea. And and I would say if if you're on that path looking at uh, proposing a bigger event, a lot of times a really great way to start that process is um, have a workshop at a at a convention or a conference. That's a really great way to sort of dip your toe in and chances are you enter that room with three or four people who you know are really passionate and interested in the topic and by the time you're done you've got 20 new names and emails and contacts that are working on the same things and sort of approaching that same problem Um, so it's like this instant networking and now all of a sudden you're like wait that's the right number of people to put together a bigger thing. Um, So I I think that's a great kind of gateway to any of these events. And all of these groups need, they need measurable help. (laughs) Well, that's such Um, a great point, Leslie. Uh, Just to jump in there. uh, It always takes a village on these things. It really takes a large group of people, even just to put together a workshop. Like if if you want to get, four or five panelists involved and find a moderator. Uh, Like it's a lot of legwork to do that. And having a network of people who can help put it together, uh, I think really, really makes it possible and makes it really great presentation. And and just to think like, I I feel like every time I go to a conference session or something, I'm sitting there full of ideas for what could be coming next. Like whether they're research topics that I want to dive into or suggestions for something that could come up in the future and just jotting all those ideas down and engaging with the network there can start to fuel what can become a recurring series of conferences or or, uh, conference convention tracks or workshops. 
Bill Schoenberg has patiently been waiting with his hand raised. So uh, Bill, unusual for me, unusual for me being patient. But I, I, even if you don't have your own idea, I would like to recommend uh, under the ways of getting involved with your local section, reach out to your local members uh, to sort of mine them for ideas. Everybody comes to a local section meeting and says, well, you know, we have this idea. Uh, some people have large discussions with members trying to, to uh, ascertain what they're interested in. And then another largely untapped resource is uh, student sections in your region, in your area. Uh, I'm particularly close to this because the big Webster University Student Summit starts tomorrow. And it's turned into a huge event, and it's run by the students. And they are always, uh, we don't want them really to think that this is the you know culmination of their career by. And uh, so that's, that's what I'll be working on uh, tomorrow and the next day is trying to get them to say, this is the kind of thing we can do all the time, uh, even to the ones that haven't been to New York. So don't don't think that just because you don't have an idea doesn't mean one of your colleagues or fellow members uh, isn't just simmering with uh, great ideas. Thank you, Bill. I think it's, I think it's important to point out too the volunteer time and the commitment to volunteering, which um, Leslie, Brad, and uh, Brett and I have discussed before. Um, the, the volunteer time is maybe two to four hours a month, right? You have a, a, a monthly most of the time you have a monthly committee meeting or planning meeting, um, which is about an hour. And then you could estimate three hours of work uh, in between meetings. So you're really looking at, you know, two to four hours of, of committing your time to volunteer to this great organization. I, I think another way, you know, speaking of those sort of monthly um, low commitment, but really important uh, ways to get involved are for the three of us, we are all chairing subcommittees of the ECC. Obviously, you think about conventions, conferences, and T&D events. It's such a huge uh, uh, landscape of events that the AES is hosting um, that we've split out, and we each have a subcommittee that's looking at long-term strategic initiatives within our areas, looking at ways to support um ideas that are in development or that are sort of in production, you know, they've been approved and they're, they're um, getting, getting ramped up to an event. Um, and those, those are really cool ways to kind of see what happens under the hood of some of these events. Uh, you know, I went to, to conventions for years before having any clue, all the inner workings that are sort of lurking behind the scenes to make these uh, outwardly very smooth and, and calm and a, you know, exciting in the right way, sort of events happening, but there's, there's years of planning that go into those things. And so getting an overview of that by joining one of our committees is, is a fantastic way to really kind of see what's happening. And, and also maybe if you're thinking, Hey, I, I want to host a conference or I want to run a T and D event, or I want to be on a convention committee, you get a, a bit more of an in-depth overview than you would coming straight from, you know, perhaps I presented a paper or a workshop and now I'm going to dive right into the deep end. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I've gone slightly out of order here, but I think joining one of our events committees uh, where we're just co-chairs of those committees, but they are much larger groups of a, of a bunch of people contributing. Uh, we would be so grateful to have more voices in that room, especially representing a plurality of, of different types of members across the industry. Uh, Brett and Leslie, I wonder if you could describe a little bit more about what the organizing committees for each conference and convention do and what the roles within those committees are. Who wants to start? I, I go for it. <laughs> All right, sir. Um, so the roles of the organizing committees for a conference, um, when you get your when you first get started, most important is to have your your chair, and you can have a co chair, the people that um, oversee everything, um, and then to have your papers chair because that's a huge process of, of it, and your treasurer, um, so the the money is taken care of, and then. As your proposal and budget get flushed in, um, you know, you might have eight on your organizing committee, maybe a lot of local volunteers or a student section that helps volunteer. But those eight people would, um, you know, workshop chair, 
speaker chair, um, you know, they would fill in the roles that are needed to build the outline of the conference. And then a lot of that is done in conjunction with, you know, we get together with HQ as well after the initial proposal and budget to see how much HQ is needed um, for things like registration um, or if it's, you know, what scale things are done because every conference is different. Some are very small and some are huge. Um, so yeah, the organizing committee is, you know, responsible. And, and uh, in a lot of ways, the, Convention organizing committee mirrors what's happening in a conference. Uh, there are some slight differences and in intricacies. Um, I would say probably the main difference is that uh, a goodly portion of a convention uh, in a, a major, um, like a New York convention, convention and show that has a full trade floor, um, there's a bit more input from HQ. There's so many moving parts to those things, especially when you're dealing with a large convention center where there's a million line items on every correspondence, you know, so no one's going to get thrown into like, ah, figure out how all this works. I, I promise you that much. Um, but it has a similar structure. There's chairs who are sort of coordinating the entirety of the committee. Um, and then there are, are chairs for different areas or subject groupings. So there'll be somebody who's dealing with all of the papers. And usually there's two of those people who are coordinating uh, reviews and acceptances and scheduling. Uh, and then there might be another person or two who is dealing with uh, coordinating all the workshops. And then they might have a couple of area experts who are um, more carefully curating content for, let's say, all things immersive audio and virtual reality and augmented reality. And then somebody else might be curating things that deal with broadcast, webcast, internet um, audio or web audio. Um, so, so there are sort of different levels even within the committee of granularity. Um, but one thing that I think is, is really a kind of stand apart difference between conferences and conventions, um, since conferences tend to focus around a very specific area of the industry, um, it tends to attract people who are invested in that area of the industry. Uh, it's kind of the exact opposite with conventions. You tend to find people from the farthest uh, reaches of the industry on one committee together, um, sometimes local, sometimes international, sometimes all the way on the other side of the world, um, but are passionate about a topic which fits into the larger scheme of a convention. And okay. Oh, I was I was just going to add one other, one other thing. Um, so uh, some of you have probably heard rumblings about different convention shapes and sizes. And as conventions are developing and we're, we're seeing more and more members in various regions around the globe, we want to make sure that everyone is getting that full AES experience and ability to attend conventions. So there's a growing distinction between the AES convention and show, which is New York currently, which is the big trade show floor and all of these over the top kind of uh, complications and has to be a lot of very meticulous uh, budgeting and things and sort of a happy medium with conventions that omit some of that commercial portion, which tends to be so complicated and function more like Leslie was saying conference committees function where it's really dr uh, driven at the local and committee volunteer level. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities kind of from top to bottom, I think. Yeah. And, and no doubt conferences feed conventions. Absolutely. Because they go off on their specific tracks and you can't have that commercial value because it compromises the, the peer review and scientific part of it. But the findings of those things absolutely feed the bigger events. Yeah. It's really, it, you know, when I was I was trying to come up with some kind of stereotypical diagram of what ECC does, I kept, you know, with pyramids and, and sort of different layers of things. And all of these things really feed each other. You know, a T&D event turns into a conference. The amazing work done at a conference shows up at a convention. A session at a convention comes together and says, we could talk about this for three days. Hey, you know, it's three days. I 
a conference, you know, all of these things really play so nicely together. And I'm really glad with the ECC functioning the way it does, it's a nice place to kind of see how all these things move together and feed each other. You know, that, that gets to something that Shelly Ann mentioned in the chat of, uh, I think there are great opportunities for meaningful redundancy within programming. So, uh, you know, an event that somebody presents at the audio for games conference in Tokyo, um, there, you might as well pr propose some version of that if you're also going to be at the convention and show in New York, because it's going to be a different audience. And maybe there's a different spin on that. Uh, maybe you're presenting a paper at the Audio for Games thing, but you want to uh, take some other papers on that around that topic and get those people together in a workshop in New York. And that sort of continuing to evolve subjects and topics, I think, is really important to a researcher career, but also to providing benefits to a broad cross-section of members. And it's also a nice thing. We are not quite at the level of organization where we do a great job of communicating between uh, between groups. So uh, a submission that maybe gets goes in for a workshop or a paper submission for a conference might not fit with that particular conference. So it, it isn't able to be accepted there. Um, you should definitely submit it to other conferences and to conventions and send us something about whether it could be a good T&D event, because there's a very good chance, just like that Encanto program we had, that it didn't work at a convention was a great fit for a T&D event, or maybe didn't, the, these conference committees get so many papers submitted, so many workshop proposals, they can't accept them all. But that doesn't mean somebody should be dejected that their workshop was refused. Please consider uh reformatting it and submitting it for a, a future convention or other activity. Good question. Should, should we, um, Vincenzo, should we get onto the form time, time wise? Should yeah, we I was, I was just that? looking at the time Good too. Point, Leslie. So I, as Vincenzo pulls that up, I will say one other thing. Um, if you're trying to get involved and hopefully Bill doesn't virtually throw something at me when I say this, but <laughs> Your, your regional VPs are such an amazing resource. I guarantee <laughs> he's getting ready. Uh, I guarantee if you're like, I don't know where, where to go with this. I want to be involved. I'm not sure where to go. Your regional VPs or any of us on this call, the HQ staff, like everyone's interested in getting people active and involved. So I think if you reach out to, to those people who are, are accessible, chances are, you know, somebody in that group, right? So find that person, you know, and say, Hey, I've got this idea. Where do I go? And we're going to talk about where some of those ideas live, but if you're not sure where they live, or you're not sure it's fully formed yet, just, just say something to somebody. Cause I guarantee there's a place for it. So Leslie, um, I have the website pulled up, uh, AES2.org. Um, uh, right on the homepage, we have this uh, e uh, menu bar over here with events. So we have the uh, submission form right on this events page, right here in this blue uh, bar over here. Have an idea for an event or something you'd like to contribute to an existing AES event? Tell us about it. All right. And so Brett's point a moment ago, ago, it's something we've talked about a lot. Um, section events, we're not trying to, you know, work with your section, go through your chair, go through your VP. We're not trying to usurp that. We're just trying to um, go toward larger scale things. So, um, but this is the form for that. Um, and it's general right now. Um, we're going to have a different one for recurring conferences that'll streamline into our proposals but we won't put you through that survey monkey form anymore. We have this one um, for all general stuff that will filter to all of us through smart sheets that HQ has created for us. And, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Are you a member? Have you been on something before? Tell a bit about your idea and topic. I'm going to throw up in Chenzo if you keep scrolling while I'm reading. Sorry. Um, target audience, possible location, um, anticipated length. Will there be papers? Um, best guess of participants and attendance, uh, frame of mind. And if you can't answer any, some of these, I wouldn't worry about that. Just answer as much as you can. Yeah. And I think, I think this form is going to be a really great way. If you've got, 
half of those answers. You know exactly who you're targeting. You know exactly what the topic is, but you say to yourself, I, I don't know, how long should this event be or, or where should this be or should it be in person? You know, go with, with what you're thinking off the cuff and we're going to get all this information and we're going to do our best to help figure out, okay, we know sort of how these areas break down. Let's figure out where this goes. Um, so, so that I think is going to be a huge improvement in the way these ideas come to fruition going forward. Yeah. And, and there may be things like a case where somebody has a great idea for something and we've gotten another submission from somebody else who has a similar idea and we're able to connect those dots and say, well, you, you both happen to be in the same region. So maybe it makes sense for this to be a regional or section thing. Maybe you should get in touch with that person or you, you are from other parts across the world then uh, may not be aware that you're both thinking about the same great idea. Let's get you connected. Cause that could be the kernel of a committee that has a conference or a, a yeah. workshop group or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I this this form will probably continue to evolve a little bit, but I think all of the main nuts and bolts are here now. So if if you're sitting here and you answered yes to that, do you have an idea for an event question? Now there's one nice, simple place to put that information. If you and it's perfectly fine if you still say to yourself, eh, I'd like to run run a small version of this. I'd like to run something at the section level, or I'd like to run this as a workshop or a tutorial and really see, you know, do 50 people show up? Do 200 people show up? Do we have to repeat it again on the street outside Javits because too many people were were waiting in the hallway? You know, you can, you can by all means do that. But if you're really not sure kind of where to go, I think this is this is a great place. And and if we do get an idea like that where you say, ah, you know, I want to I want to do this as a workshop, but I'm not sure where. It'll connect with us and we can help get you to the right convention committee or the right conference committee as well. Um thank you. Um, so now we come to Q and a, and I saw there were a couple questions that look like they've probably been answered during the, um, through the chat, but, um, does anyone have a question? If you do, uh, raise your hand, um, we can unmute you. What if the section is non-stagnant or non-active? I'll let Monica, if you want to respond to that via the chat, um, if we didn't answer your question in the chat, just let us know. It looks like most of them have been answered. Yeah, I can't help but but chime in on that one. If you have a stagnant or non-active section, sounds like you might be the right person to get it active again. Uh, we had absolutely a, a couple of places I've been. We've had that that situation where you know there people move, people change, change where they're working, whatever, and you know what? It's, it's time for some new blood. It's all it's all you. It's always difficult too for for um, section leaders or, or regional leaders to find out who to whom they need to speak, and so if you know somebody who is in a section, uh, even if they're not the candidate for a new uh, chair or vice chair or anything like that, even if they might know someone who is, we're we're blind here. Lashonda has been working very hard trying to um, uh, find these contacts, but uh, we simply don't have them. So uh, so. Don't don't hesitate to share information about anything that will help AES along any of us. I think we're very close to being able to put a lot of fresh energy into sections as well because of the launch of our tools. Instead of everybody having to create the wheel, it's going to be a lot easier if something's in place that we can put our energy into getting into people's enthusiasm instead of trying to do it all if you're if, if you're an officer or something. Yeah. I, you know, that's such a good point, Leslie. And I think one thing I've observed uh, in a lot of local sections is people get really, really involved and put so much time and effort. And maybe after a year or two, they start to burn out because they're doing so much work. And I, I think one uh, place for this sort of form just to submit your ideas 
is to make sure there's still a space for people to volunteer where they're like, I can't take on chairing my local section. Uh, I can't take on spinning up my local section, but I still want to contribute. I still want to find a way to provide some volunteer, you know, level of engagement because this is something that's very important to me. Um, so don't don't feel like you have to spin up your local section to still become a very involved contributor in the AES. Um, we may push on you to spin up your local section because there are a lot of local sections that need that help. Um, but I think the the more people we can get involved, the more we can spread out the work so it doesn't end up being you know a small committee on the local level doing a ton of work and eventually burning out. I see Monica's got her hand raised, but Brad, there's a great question for you in the chat if you didn't see it. Yeah, go go ahead and take the question, then I can make my comment. Or do you want to comment and Brad can read? I can do that too. <laughs> uh, it kind of uh, taps on to what Brad was saying. Uh, I know sometimes you, especially if you've attended an event, it can seem like a big, scary thing to to put your hand up and say, have you thought about this? Because there's a lot of brilliant people who are also behind a lot of this content and a lot of the organization. Um, that's only going to make things better, continue to improve. It, it doesn't even have to be an idea on a topic. If you've seen some uh, format work really, really well, or that was really engaging or really energized you, you know, we think back to the words that were used at the beginning, what inspired you, what made you excited, what gave you energy. Uh, we want to continually improve on the way that we're delivering content um, and make it digestible and make it something that you want to be active in. So be sure to kind of include those ideas too. Um, we're also working on shorter term, smaller ways to be engaged and, and volunteer your time. So you don't feel like I don't have a year to give on planning this event. I have, you know, an hour or I can do something on site or I, I could contribute in this way. Uh, so there's a lot of, of other opportunities as well. Um, and a lot of things outside of events. So just wanted to throw that out. That's such a good point, Monica. And and Shelby had a great question here in the chat, uh, which I think all of us should actually answer because we have different perspectives on this. Um, uh, her question was specific to webinars. How much lead time do you need between someone proposing an idea for a webinar to making it happen? Uh, generally, it takes uh, about six weeks. And some of this is also trying to find a place in the programming where it slots in nicely. Um, both in terms of saying we don't want to have lots of overlapping events. Uh, we're trying to keep an eye on what regions and local sections are also programming. So we don't, you know, put something on top of a great program in that the Pacific Northwest section is doing or something like that. The other thing is uh, we have a very small but mighty HQ staff and we don't want to totally burn them out by saying, hey, next week we're doing a webinar. <laughs> And they always jump and help to support us, but we don't want to do too much of that. So we want to be thoughtful in scheduling those things, because if a bunch of the HQ staff is working really hard to promote a conference uh, that's coming up, we don't want to have to pull a bunch of their attention to send them to a webinar. So Shelby, a uh, long answer to a short question, usually about six weeks for webinars. Uh, but this, I think, opens up another question for you, Leslie, and you, Brett. What is the lead time to get a, a new conference together. Conventions is even longer. How long does it take to organize one of these? For conferences, prefer preferably um, 18 to 24 months. Um, and that's, that's to get things generally established. Um, and every conference is different too, but generally the ECC won't look at it as such if it's under a year. Um, it just takes a lot in the timeline. So ideally 18 to 24 months and there's a little leeway in there, but um, nobody wants to, to do these last minute. And for conventions, I'm going to knock on wood here. Um, ideally, we're looking at about a three year run up is is the goal. Um, so we're looking at uh, 2026 2025 and 2026 locations for conventions. Um, but there's also sort of an, an interesting uh, a little spin on this for conventions. 
uh, the committee starts with one or two people and builds from there. So there's rarely more than one person who's involved for three years. Usually there's one or two of these chairs who are involved for that entire time. Um, whereas a lot of the committee will be formed up probably a year to 18 months out. Um, so things sort of grow over that three years. And then we have the soul, the, the whole sort of convention army uh, mustered at the actual event where we have volunteers and people in every room and, and all that happening. So there's a bit of a, more of a range there, um, but the idea should be years away. And that's a good point, Brett. I, I should say with what I said, there's no minimum <laughs> or there's no maximum to how soon you can plan. Like we are looking at 2026 and with recurring, I mean, we look years in advance, so there's no maximum. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the the puzzle. And I feel like Brad might have the, the hardest job of of all, because we're sort of like tiling these things, you know, looking at like, oh, let's look at our two-year calendar. Let's look at our three-year calendar. And Brad's like, okay, what are we doing in quarter two of of this year? You know, what are we doing in quarter three? So um, that's where I think the ECC has really benefited all of these different event types is all of a sudden there's this more macro view of how everything fits together and, and uh, creates a more cohesive year worth of programming at a time. And I, you know, I think a lot of ideas come in and the kernel is wrapped as, oh, I want to have a convention in Walla Walla, Washington. And then we sort of work with the people who have this great idea and say, okay, let's, let's shape that to say, is Walla Walla the, the destination for an international convention? Do you have a good international airport? Do you have a space that can facilitate this kind of thing? And sometimes we start to help shape that idea into, well, what you need is a, a, uh, a great event in Walla Walla for your local community. Let's help get you in touch with the right people. Or what you have is is the makings of something really great and really topical and really timely, and we need to act on it within three to six months. We can't spin up a massive convention in three to six months, but we could spin up an online symposium. And that could still meet 95% of your criteria for sharing great information with the community. Yeah. And I think that's something that distinguishes all of the AES events. You look at, uh, there are some societies, some scholarly groups where um, the research timeline is years. You know, you spend a decade writing a paper because clinical trials and approvals and development take so long. But because our industry is relatively young compared to, you know, some fields of science and research. And because it's so technology driven, there are ideas that just, that just can't wait. So you could plan a conference, but maybe looking two years out means the kernels, like you said, these, these sort of Genesis ideas are going to be wildly different two years from now. So that's a great place to get a a panel together for a convention um, because you can do that every six months, more or less, or even sooner. Um, so, so that shortens your timeline or a T and D event. It, it really, there's something that fits every scenario, I think, between the three event types or. That's a great point. Like, like with AI, you can't wait a year to, you know, put out developments and stuff like that. So great point. And the journal still sits alongside all these events. So you can still submit a paper to the journal if you have pressing research that, uh, you know, I'm I'm not not sure exactly what the journal's approval timeline is, but uh, they have a bit more agility because they're not trying to get people into a physical location. Yeah. Yeah. And and even... Uh, not to get too much onto the paper side, but conventions as well have multiple paper types. We have the, this is a killer idea. I came up with this in June and I want to present it in November. And we have the, this is the last five years of my life, you know, put together in this very long-term study. Um, So AES is, is really amazing when it comes to that, to figuring out kind of what the timeline is that suits the discipline or the sub discipline. Well, I think that brings us to 1 p.m. Um, so, Leslie, Brett, and Brad, thank you for your time today. Thank you for volunteering uh, with AES and everything you do in your role. Much appreciated by not only the staff, but the entire AES membership. Um, hopefully, our attendees today will leave um, learning uh, 
having a better understanding of how to connect, engage, and submit ideas for events uh, for the benefit of all AES members. Um, thank you to the attendees for joining and staying for the hour. We, appre we appreciate uh, you, and we hope that you volunteer and uh, join us on leading one of these calls in the near future. Um, so thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great day.